we're going to focus on in this session is verse 19 of 1 Peter 4, which says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And the question I want to ask is, how do you do good to those who are hurting you? This is unbelievably difficult. And today, as I see things, people are opposing this kind of teaching because they say, if you encourage the doing of good to those who hurt you, you're an enabler. You're compromising. You're joining the abuser in his evil if you encourage love or returning good for evil. This is huge in every age and and especially in ours, I think. And the, the way we'll go about answering it is just trying to be sensitive to the meaning of the key words here and their relationship with each other and some of the connections with what's gone before and elsewhere in the letter. So, Father, I know how hard this is for me to to do good to those who hurt me, offend me, and I pray for miracles to happen through the meditation on your word so that we would be the kind of counter-cultural people you call us to be as citizens of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read this in context. It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, this is what we're looking at, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. First question, what, what does according to God's will mean? It defines suffering. Does it mean, uh, here's the first possibility, uh, if you suffer, that's God's will. Or does it mean the way you suffer? should be according to God's will. The, if you suffer, is he saying God will decide whether you suffer or not? And one of the things supporting that interpretation would be noticing right here that judgment begins with the household of God, and that is this suffering. So it's clearly God's ultimate design And we know that's the case back in chapter 3, verse 17. It is better for you, uh, better to suffer for doing good if, if that should be God's will. So it might mean, meaning number one, that suffering according to God's will means if God wills, we suffer. Or it might mean suffer in the way God wants you to suffer. And remember, just what, a few verses earlier in verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or a meddler. Don't suffer that way. Suffer according to God's will, doing good, not doing evil. Now, frankly, I do not know for sure which one of those Peter intended. But what I do know, this is... Here's a strategy for thinking and teaching and preaching and and counseling. When you run into a situation like this where you're not sure which of the meanings is meant here by Peter, and yet you know from 3.17 and from this word right here that meaning number one is true, and you know that there is a way to, to suffer that pleases God, and in verse 15, a way to suffer that displeases God, that this meaning is also true. You can just say that. Say that to your small group or say that to your congregation. I'm not sure, but both are true. 
And so let's just let both stand here, and maybe one will help make sense of the rest of the verse and therefore commend itself. So we let those who suffer, if God wills, or let those who suffer in the way God approves, let them... Now, what? next question. What are they commanded to do? What are the sufferers commanded to do? They are commanded to and trust their souls to a faithful creator while or in doing good. Not just entrust your soul to a faithful creator and wait around to go to heaven while the world goes to hell in a handbasket and it doesn't make any difference what you do to it because it's rotten to the core and none of your good deeds are going to make any difference anyway. That's not the way Peter thinks. He says, and trust your souls doing good. So we're not promised that we'll be given life here, but we are promised we ought to be doing good till the day we die, till we take our last breath. Our job on planet Earth is do as much good to other people as we can. Nor does he say, just do good. You know, screw up your courage, be a stoic, pretend like the the suffering doesn't hurt, and and be a, a person who does lots of good. That is not what he says. He says both. And you got to take them together and trust your souls while doing good or in doing good. So in answer to the question that I raised at the beginning, how do you do good to those who hurt you? The answer is by trusting and trusting your soul to a faithful creator. What is, what is that? Do you remember chapter 2, verse 23, when Jesus was reviled? 2.23, when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. The way Jesus endured the cross and kept doing good for us, ultimately ultimate good for us, was by entrusting himself to his Father. And here he is doing it in Luke 23, 46, Jesus calling out with a loud voice on the cross and said, Father, into your hands I commit. That's the same word for entrust to a faithful creator. I commit my spirit. That's the way. You're able to do good. You, you trust your soul to a God who, back here in verse 18, saves. The righteous is scarcely saved, but oh, they are saved. This soul is going to be saved, and you can utterly count on it by entrusting your soul. So no matter what they do to you, you are safe forever and ever, which frees you to be done with revenge Hand that over to God and keep on doing good. Which leaves one last question for me, and I'm sure there are others. Why does it say to a faithful creator? Why not to a merciful father or a great savior? Or why focus on the word creator and faithful? Of course, the word faithful conjures up, he keeps his promises promises what? Like 312, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayer. He hasn't ignored you. He's not looking away from you, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And that's these people that are treating you so badly. His faith is against those who do evil. His eyes are on you and he keeps his promises. So we expect faithful. We need a faithful God. But why the word creator? Say instead of father. Jesus handed his soul over to his father as he was dying. And my attempt to think that through is to say these people are are small and insignificant and beleaguered and they feel so weak and so marginal in the Roman Empire And they need to be reassured that the God into whose hands they are committing their souls is a mighty God. And the reason I feel feel 
that that power is probably what's being thought of when he puts creator here is because if you go to 411 in in the last next to the last chapter or just just earlier here in what we're looking at now and you come to the end of that paragraph he says to him belong glory and dominion the word there's kratos power And when you get to the very end of the book, the very last thing he says, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, establish you. Can he? Can he? I know he's faithful, but can he? To him be the dominion. He could have said glory, He said, dominion forever and ever. That's the last thing he says about God in this book. Power. To him be creator dominion. He made it all. He has dominion over it all. So entrust your soul to one who keeps his promises and has all power so that you know you will be saved And therefore, all vengeance can be handed over to him, and you can, till your last breath, keep on doing good to those who hurt you. What a witness to the reality of God.